the Alien franchise reimagined how we think about outer space horror in literature, films, and games. Audiences have been enthralled by the story of one of the most iconic heroines in cinema, Ellen Ripley, played by Sigourney Weaver. Get away from her, you bitch! At the same time, Alien delivered a new form of terror for science fiction through the introduction of the bloodthirsty xenomorph. Whether you've actually seen any of the movies or not, you can most likely recognize elements from this universe inspired in other fictional works, represented in amusement park rides, or parodied in pop culture media that older and younger generations can recognize. By the release of this video, we'll be nearing the 34th anniversary of the 1986 release of Aliens later in July. For me, Aliens happens to be one of my favorite James Cameron sequels next to Judgment Day. I thought the anniversary would be a fun exercise to take a moment to reflect on the franchise's journey since it's released 41 years ago. The franchise carries a history of the general consensus fluctuating with negative reception, partially directed towards the dramatic tonal shifts since the original. However, I disagree that these creative changes hindered the franchise. In fact, I'd say a majority of these works are on brand and build upon the spirit behind the alien identity we recognize today. If you haven't seen any of the films or games, I recommend watching them or going on the week if you want a better sense of the lore, since I won't be explaining much of that in this essay. Otherwise, I intend to see if the negativity towards the overall franchise holds any merit by examining the changes in visuals and character depictions across its different entries. For this retrospective, I'm going to dive into the franchise's feature films, the quintology and prequels, as well as a small selection of video games. I won't be examining the literature, graphic novels, and short films because I'd like to leave that discussion open to future exploration. In addition, I'll refrain from discussing the Alien vs. Predator arc of the franchise, since that's a different topic I'd like to reserve for a later time as well. Now, without further ado, let's take a step back and take a peek at the legacy left behind by Alien. For the past four decades, the Alien films operated under the same studios, 20th Century Fox and Brandywine Productions. However, the series incorporated a mix of different directors and writers presenting their own interpretation of the Alien universe in each film. Director David Fincher and crew worked toward completion of the new movie that would take an already classic series to yet another level. Each film ranging from the first in 1979 to Alien Covenant in 2017 would implement a unique vision that either evolved or drifted away from the tonal shape since the original movie. Most of the franchise's identity revolves around its visual consistency and preserving its unique sci-fi visual style to the world and characters. The first film sets the foundation for the franchise's environmental design that's carried over in future works. Specifically, designs for the ships and environments take inspiration from the artworks of Christopher Foss and John Gerodes to produce the visual foundation that's principal to the franchise's world building. And for the first time, I saw somebody whose stuff I liked as much as Ron Cobb's stuff. This architectural style evolved in the film's subsequent entries, primarily changing in scale and blending with each director's respective vision. Even in Aliens 3, where the series takes a more gothic design to the architecture, we still see hints of Foss and Giraud's style on occasion. This blend is similar in Alien Covenant, where the film mixes ancient architecture with futuristic technology to depict the fallen society of the alien engineers. In addition to the architectural style, these environments are primarily set in interior and confined areas located within ships and colonies. These tight spaces enclose the audience into a distinctly sci-fi world separate from reality, while also serving as obstacles that inhibit the survivability of the characters in each film. It isn't until Prometheus and Alien Covenant where the film utilizes more exterior on-set locations. On one hand, these outdoor landscapes depict isolation differently by making the universe appear terrifyingly sublime when we scale the world to the minuscule presence of the characters. On the other, their environment grounds the audience with spaces that are reminiscent to what we already see in reality, similar in Alien 3. In addition, the film eliminates tension when characters occasionally experience peril in clear and open spaces. However, when the films overall depict danger within closed or obscured areas, we return to the same feeling of claustrophobia and inescapability captured since the original. Color and lighting also build upon constructing the tense environmental tone across the franchise. A majority of the films, especially within the first two entries, consist of cool color temperatures with dark lighting that obscures our line of sight to the world and characters. This presentation constructs 
a cold atmosphere that depicts deep space as being bleak and isolated, moods that are essential for creating suspenseful terror within the films. Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection somewhat deviate from this tone by incorporating warmer color temperatures mixed with stronger lighting to the environment. This tonal shift matches with the more dynamic editing and visceral violence in both films, offering a more intense and oppressive atmosphere. Alongside these visual transformations, we have changes to how the films depict Ellen Ripley, the Quintology's main heroine, and the xenomorph across each different director and writer. Ripley, what the hell are you doing? With Ripley, she undergoes various transformations to what her character is and how she's represented within the franchise. From the first film, we have her surviving the xenomorph attack by relying on her wits and desperate drive for survival. Over the course of the franchise, however, Ripley becomes more hardened and stoic to a point where we ultimately end with her becoming a literal superhuman by alien resurrection. Consequently, she becomes a figure we eventually can't project our emotional anxieties onto since she slowly dominates her fears over the course of the franchise. Instead, we find alternative ways of sympathizing with her through becoming more drawn to her motivations stemming beyond survival, such as her newfound duty for fighting against the Xenomorphs to challenging her humanity when it's compromised in resurrection. For the Xenomorph, Swiss artist H.R. Yeager set the foundation for its haunting physical anatomy, with each movie offering new depictions for its appearances and behaviors. The alien's design would shift from practical effects relying on latex costumes, to rod puppetry, to more recently CGI as methods of giving it more dynamic and animalistic movements. In addition to the design, the way the Xenomorph conveyed terror shifted respective to each film. The first two alien films were subtle with portraying the alien's attacks through quick cuts and off-screen deaths. This allowed the audience to envision the horrifying possibilities of what happened to the victims, thus producing horror based on the audience's limitless sense of imagination. However, the later films depart from primarily relying on subtle horror by being more direct with depicting the alien's animalistic nature. Specifically, we have moments where the film proudly displays gratuitous gore, along with the alien visibly pursuing and attacking its victims. The xenomorph and its other variations carry a more direct presence in depicting its visible horror. Consequently, that directness trades off from the subtleness that made the earlier films initially suspenseful to watch with a different approach to terror. Despite these varied presentations towards the visuals and characters, each subsequent addition to the franchise expands upon the world building unique to the alien identity. Every depiction for the franchise's iconic characters and style simply offers alternative ways of blending terror and fun that's kept the world constantly evolving from the previous entry. Ultimately, these films have set the foundation to further exploration for other art mediums, such as one of my favorite formats of all, video games. Alongside the movies, the Alien franchise has gathered a lengthy list of video games dating all the way back from the Atari to ones designed for the modern console. With that in mind, I'd like to touch upon two games, Alien Colonial Marines and Alien Isolation. Alien Colonial Marines is a 2013 first-person shooter sci-fi adventure where the story is tied to the aftermath of aliens. Here, you play as a member of the eponymous military force to investigate a distress call sent out by Aliens' Corporal Hicks as you fight your way through corporate mercenary gunfire and the alien-infested ruins of the Hadley's Hope colony. Upon release, the game received vocal negativity from critics and players alike. Part of the negativity was directed towards the final look of the overall game, primarily from major gameplay differences between the demo and final version. There were also issues with the game's AI, which apparently stemmed from an error in a single line of code only discovered in 2017. Backlash from the game eventually rose to a point where in 2013, two players sued Gearbox Software, so they were eventually dropped from the suit, and Sega for false advertisement. However, despite its flaws, Alien Colonial Marines served its purpose in attempting to capture some of Cameron's visual style from Aliens. The environmental design for Hadley's Hope and the ship takes inspiration from the film, with mixing Foss's futuristic design with the bleak lunar landscape. In addition, the weapons and tools within the game utilize the same sound and model designs, which further builds onto immersing the player into the Alien universe. And setting the game as a first-person shooter does offer the player to embody a high-octane action character that echoes the macho energy depicting the original Colonial Marines. Granted, I also have my issues with some of the gameplay and writing, which made the game a chore to burn through, I found the xenomorph somewhat annoying instead of terrifying to fight against, and the dialogue felt a bit bland and annoying. 
but the game does present an adequate attempt to capture Aliens' charm within the game's design of the world. In some respect, Alien Colonial Marines was a step towards bridging the world-building experience for fans between the films and games. And thankfully, we have another game that goes beyond the issues tied to that title by ultimately demonstrating how we can still have a fresh yet familiar experience for the franchise. I ultimately refer to Alien Isolation. Alien Isolation is a first-person horror survival game set between the events of Alien and Aliens. We play as Amanda Ripley, the daughter of Ellen Ripley who was first mentioned in the special edition of Aliens. She learns that a flight recorder belonging to the Nostromo has been located and is on board a space station called Sevastopol. In hopes of finding closure to her mother's disappearance, Amanda accompanies a small team associated with the Yutani Whalen Corporation, a research and colonization company, in their embarkment to Sevastopol, only to find themselves trapped on a station gone awry with crazed scavengers. Killers synthetics, and of course, the Xenomorph. What makes Alien Isolation fascinating for fans of the franchise is how the game captures the essence of the earlier Alien movies into a familiar yet new experience. The game intends to immerse us in the same tonal atmosphere of the first movie, while to a degree giving flexibility for players to shape their own survival experience through the gameplay. A majority of how the game grounds us in the Alien universe ultimately comes from the objectives set by the development team, Creative Assembly. They limited the majority of planning their environmental design to what would have been possible to construct by 1979. With this mindset, they deconstruct all the design and technology that gave the first film its identity and used that deconstruction to give the game a unique spin on that original aesthetic. At EGX 2014, members of Creative Assembly gave audiences their approach towards making the game. You know, for us, Alien Isolation really is the alien game that we've always wanted to play. A game that goes back to the roots of the series. You know, we really wanted to make a game where just one alien could be a really meaningful and really terrifying interaction for the player. It's the core that we built the rest of the game around. Yet, for the aliens to really truly work, we had to create a very believable world. We wanted to make a game that really immersed the player, that really, really sucked them into the atmosphere. And what we would do is we'd create archetypes, and an archetype would be a style guide of props, uh, materials, fixtures, fittings. This would be used to create a visual language which we could then move on from and, and create whole new assets and whole new spaces for the Sevastopol. You know, they'd feel uh, authentic but still be original, still be new for the player. The original film was incredibly detailed. To make the Sevastopol believable in the same way, we had to keep that level of detail going through all of our spaces throughout the station. Um, now this detail adds backstory, adds atmosphere and it can inform the gameplay, things like player navigation and whether they get lost or not. Sound is a really emotional medium. It kind of works on a subconscious level, so it can evoke all kinds of feelings like anxiety, fear, stress, tension, release. And that's a really important part of creating a horror experience because we want to push the player emotionally. we had was the original sound effects that had been recorded by the British sound engineers over at Shepparton 35 years ago meant we could make more of this original content. But what we've been able to do is take the original recordings and we've been able to make more, which is amazing. And through Amanda Ripley, we're transported back to our initial depiction of Ellen Ripley by their parallelisms. What makes both Ripleys remarkable is that both are fundamentally ordinary people placed into extraordinary circumstances. Their survivability primarily revolves around using their wits to outsmart danger. With Amanda Ripley, we're not playing as a hardened colonial marine, but instead a character susceptible to dangerous and unpredictable situations who we can better project onto. In their own respects, each character is unique in her motivations and personality, but both serve as con for the player to experience fear that's unique to the Alien franchise. Alien Isolation recaptured the same awe and terror that fascinated audiences of the first film, while also serving as an accumulation of elements that gave the franchise its identity in all the movies. The game essentially gives players the flexibility of shaping their own unique alien survival experience based on how much they choose to engage or fear the world around them. In some sense, this game brings a whole new opportunity of interpreting and appreciating the Alien universe for those who dare to take it. A 
akin to Ellen Ripley's story, the Alien franchise has undergone a long and transformative journey met with successes and failures vocalized by the fanbase. It's a franchise embedded with a history of creative experimentation that seeks to build off from the first movie. Every piece of visual work produced, each building onto the original design with various styles unique to the times, defined the essence of how the franchise evolved. Its lengthy development history highlights the challenges of world building for a franchise which compromises creative visions from each distinct entry. This quest for keeping the alien identity alive and fresh for all these decades is a journey that many other long established franchises endure today. Despite the negative perceptions towards certain works or styles, the alien franchise would be incomplete without the successes and hardships built onto each addition to the beloved series. Ultimately, each piece of work, the beloved and the flawed, is important for how we conceptualize the alien franchise with how we choose to appreciate other works of serialized horror today. For all the negatives involved in making a sequel, you have positives. And one of the positives is if you can take that initial programming that the audience has from the other film and then do little twists and turns on it and, like you said, play against their expectation of what's going to happen. If it's done in, in a not hostile way to the audience, then they realize that there's a little bit of fun involved and the film is having a little bit of fun with them, but it, it makes them participants. It shows that the filmmakers assume a certain knowledge on their part. Yeah.